Okay, now we're also very excited about this. Our keynote today is with a gentleman named Corey Perlman. If you're not generating results from your social media marketing, then it's just a hobby. Corey Perlman has over 10 years experience in the digital marketing space, back when words like AOL, which I still have an account, Corey, um, and Netscape meant something. He's spoken to organizations both big and small, to recognizable brands such as Dallas Cowboys, the American Health Care Association, and Cisco Foods. His latest book, Social Media Overload, became an Amazon.com bestseller in every major business category. Corey's social media agency, eBootCamp, or eBootCamp Inc., <clears throat> manages the social media marketing for over 40 brands. When he's not speaking or consulting, you can find him chasing around his two small children, desperately trying to keep them off of Instagram and YouTube. Helping us avoid social media overload, please join me in welcoming a native Floridian, fan of small batch bourbon, which is the only reason I hired him, <laughs> and the first man to wear jeans and a sport coat and not work for Google, Corey Perlman. Thank you, that is, uh, I always say that's the hardest job. And so thank you for doing that so well, I appreciate it. How's everybody doing? Thank you so much for having me here. Um, it means a lot that you took the time to be here uh, and also be in the seats today for the, for the time that we're gonna spend together. So uh, as, as he mentioned, my name is Corey Perlman. I've been doing this for gosh, 10 plus years now. And I get the chance to see a lot of cool products and this is no exception. I've spent the last 24 hours um, checking out all the different spas, and uh, you know, making my friends jealous on Facebook and Instagram. And also just wanna let you guys know that uh, it means a lot in what you all do. I'm gonna talk about it towards the end, but you help uh, make memories for people. And I have a personal story to that that I'm gonna tell you at the very end. So with all that being said, we're gonna, we're gonna jump in. This is all about social selling. Uh, it's creating a process around using digital to grow your business. And so I'm gonna spend the next hour or so and some change uh, giving you all some best practices. My hope and my goal is that you can take a couple of things, not everything, but a couple of things and use those to increase your business. Everything that I'm gonna talk about today, we've tested and proven in our agency. Things that don't work, I don't talk about. Things that have worked for our brands, I will share with you today. All right, so they're gonna go ahead and jump in. Oh, before I do begin, I do have to create a quick misconception that happens quite a bit with me as a speaker. Uh, this was not Sarah here, but uh, at, a, at an event recently, um, I came uh, out from the, the, my hotel room and got downstairs, and when the meeting planner saw me, she was very disappointed. And I was like, man, I haven't even spoken yet, but you look very, very disappointed in seeing me. What's going on? And she's like, well, you look nothing like your picture uh, when I Googled you, and so I feel like I've kind of been, been you know, had a, been, been kind of dealt a you know, can of beans here, and I was like, well, what's going on? And she said, well, I Googled Corey Feldman, and I said, I'm not Corey Feldman. Um, and she's like, well, you can talk about your movie? I said, I'm not Corey Feldman. So she literally, I'm not this guy. I just want to be very, very clear on that. My name is Corey Perlman, and this guy might, be, might have more Instagram followers than me, but I'm, I'm hoping that, that we'll, we'll have more fun together today. So. All right, so our agenda is so six social selling principles. So I'll go through these one by one. We're gonna go through these very quickly. First is uh, follow the process. So I'm gonna give you the process that we've created for using social media and digital marketing, so all of it in one, to find prospects all the way to create champion customers. Uh, prioritize your platforms. Be proud of your profiles. Create compelling content, which is the hardest part in social media. Turn your customers into champions and then your champions into your digital sales force. Because here's the thing, folks, this is what's so cool about social that a lot of us forget. Back in 1985, do you know if I asked those who worked in sales and business what the number one sales strategy would be, do you know what they would answer? What, what do you think they would answer in 1985? The number one sales strategy would be uh, in all of selling. Word of mouth. It's exactly right. Today, in 2020, do you know what the number one strategy in, in selling and business is today? No, it's word of mouth, isn't it? Think about your own businesses. It's still word of mouth. It's just done differently than it was before. Instead of neighbor to neighbor, 
It's neighbor to Facebook, neighbor to Instagram, neighbor to Google My Business, to potentially many. So the fundamentals are still the same, folks. It's just done differently. So before I kick into all of those, I want to let you know that you can relax, kick your feet up. If you want to take pictures of my slides, take pictures. If you want to shoot video, they got beautiful high definition video being shot right now, shoot video. I'm not one of these guys that's going to police you and anything that you take of my stuff, take it and run with it. I don't care. But if you want my slides, you also get those too. All you have to do is text the number 66866, so that's the phone number, 66866, and the word slides, and you'll get a copy of my slide deck today, so you don't feel like you have to take pictures of every slide that we go through. So the phone number is 66866, the word is slides. If it doesn't work for you for whatever random reason, that's totally fine. Just get me your email address, I don't care if you throw a piece of paper at me, a business card, whatever the case may be, and I will get you the slides. Sound like a deal? Also, if there happens to be any negative feedback from the presentation today, I want to hear about it. It's very important to me. There's actually a platform that I use quite a bit. It's called MySpace. You are more than welcome to post. Come on, folks, stay with me here. Post. <laughs> Whoa, that was slow. You're more than welcome to post those there. Uh, Tom, anybody remember Tom? That was your first MySpace friend. All the millennials in the room have no idea what I'm talking about right now, but you 40 and above, you know that your first friend was Tom, and he will happily take those negative responses. Hopefully, we won't have too many of those today. All right. So as my friend Marcus Limonis says from The Prophet, I stole this little line from him, trust the process. So I want to give you what we consider the process is for doing digital and doing it well uh, on social. So here it is. And again, I will send this to you, but if you want to click slides and take a picture of this, you're more than welcome to. But this is our social sales cycle. It starts with connecting, and you can write these down as you go along, and I'll give you guys some opportunity uh, to spend a little time with your tables and work on some of these things that we go through today. But number one is connect. So the first uh, area in the social selling process is obviously to connect with prospects, for them to be able to know who you are and to potentially be able to do business with you. So that's the first layer. They can't buy from you if they don't know who you are. So that's number one. But oftentimes we focus on in social media or digital marketing only that. We try to drive leads, we try to drive traffic, but we forget about the rest and we lose them throughout the process. That's why this is so important. So the first one's connect, everybody gets that. The second is strength and credibility, one that we often screw up. So they've found out about you, but now they're kicking your tires. They're checking you out on Google, your website, your social media profiles, your reviews, and you're losing them. And you don't know why you're losing them, because they don't call you up and tell you they just move on to the competition. So we're gonna talk about how to strengthen that area. And then the third one is staying top of mind. They may be interested in getting a spa or a hot tub in November, but they may not be ready to buy until April. How do you stay on their radar? How do you stay top of mind, as my friends at the back table talk to me about, without frustrating or annoying them? Social media is a fantastic way of doing that if we can create content that they deem valuable. And that's gonna be the kicker. Okay, so that's the next layer. So after staying top of mind, we wanna drive them to our sweet spot. So when they're ready to buy, how do they buy from us? So if it's an email marketing piece, if it's a video, if it's a piece of content of any form, how, how can we tell them where to go? Is it into the store? Is it on the phone? Is it over email? But we got to remind them, don't make it difficult for people to buy from us. So at the end of the high value video that we're going to talk about later on, you always want to end with, and by the way, if you want to come in and take a look at our inventory, if you would like us to come out and see what we can do for you, here's how to do that. So you got to hold their hand as you walk them down the sales process. So to your sweet spot. The next one is building rapport. Don't love them and leave them. So once they become a customer, oftentimes that's where we fail as businesses, to provide them an ex exceptional experience so that they talk about us, that word of mouth, after the sale. So how are we building rapport? How are we creating that, that customer relationship? And are we able to do that digitally? And I think we are. And I'm going to show you all how to do that. And then last but not least, if you've done all that well and you've created champions out of your customers, the 
holy grail of social is earning referrals. That word of mouth, on steroids if you will, of getting people to talk about your brands on social. That's the process. Does that make sense to everybody? Pretty easy to follow. What I want you to remember is whatever you do moving forward, make sure it fits into one of these areas and don't miss one because you might be driving all the traffic in the world, but if your website sucks or if you got crappy reviews or if I can't find your phone number, none of that matters, okay? All right. Social selling principle number two is to connect on their terms, not yours. And I learned this uh, through an interaction I had on stage here a few years ago. I was talking to a group of people just like yourselves, and we had gone through Facebook and Instagram and some of the different social channels, and all of a sudden a question in the audience came up about Snapchat. So as I was answering this question about Snapchat, a gentleman in the room screamed at the top of his lungs and interrupted the entire session. It was this, and this is a true story. It's as close as I've ever had to a heckler. It was really like scary at the time, but now it's funny. But back then it was scary. And so it wasn't being recorded at the time, so I decided to try to reenact it for you. But this is what the guy sounded like when the person simply asked a question about Snapchat. So, everybody was kind of freaked out. Some people wanted to leave, but I was like, oh, whoa, whoa, what, what's going on, man? Like, you all right? You know, like, settle down. And he was just like, I'm sorry, Corey, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, I'm just frustrated. I said, all right, well, tell me more about that. And he said, well, I feel like I got my, my hands around Facebook and, and Instagram and, uh, you know, LinkedIn and Twitter, and now along comes Snapchat, and then my daughter's talking about TikTok and what else is there out there, man? I'm just getting frustrated. I said, no problem, no problem, no problem. Just look, tell me a little bit more about your business. He said, well, I sell medical supplies to the elderly. <laughs> so we had this like moment of like silent zen, right? Where I just sort of looked at him and uh, the room was quiet. And then all of a sudden you could see the light bulb went off and he's just like, wait a second. Do I even need to worry about Snapchat? I was like, no, you don't need to worry about Snapchat. Now, I'm not dare going to tell you what the demographic of elderly is, or I would have a very short uh, speaking life cycle here. But I will tell you that that demographic, wherever it is, is not on Snapchat. And so I could see the relief come off of him as he knew that that was not a site that his business needed to focus on. So my question to you all is, what sites do we need to be on? Who is your customer? The average age group of Snapchat is age 13 to 26. Today, is that the demographic that can buy one of the products in the room? If the answer is no, I wouldn't tell you to completely ignore it, but I would certainly put it at the bottom of the priority list. Okay, that makes sense? So I'm gonna allow all of you to say no to Snapchat. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much. You're welcome, yes. I got a couple hallelujahs in my last presentation there, yes. You do not have to be on Snapchat or any social site unless it makes sense for your business. So then the question is, of course, which sites should you be on? I want you to focus on a few and do them really, really well. That's my goal for you. So let's figure out what those are. So, um, we have a phrase in our household with our kids when they ask a question a thousand times, we say, asked, answered. It has been answered. Well, we don't maybe sound like that angry, but sometimes we do. Asked, answered. We answered it. So these are questions that I get asked in every presentation, so I wanted to just throw it out there for you and answer it. And of course, if there are questions at the end, you are more than welcome to ask those as well. So what platforms should we prioritize? Here are the ones, I've done a lot of research on you guys to prepare for this presentation, and these are the ones that I suggest that you prioritize. You may have some different ones, and I'd love to hear them, but these are the ones that I got for you. First of all, Facebook and Instagram. Facebook is the only social site in the world that can use the word billions with their user base. So even though there is a flock of people that are leaving Facebook to go elsewhere, Facebook is still the behemoth in the social media space. 
and everybody age, say, 40 and above are still very active on this platform. Now, there is a crop of people, as you all know, that is flocking away from Facebook and going, and they're saying, you know what, I'm done with you, Facebook. I'm going to Instagram. And Facebook says, okay, we own them too. Go ahead, right? <laughs> See ya. You know, we're still getting our money one way or another. So Instagram, owned by Zuckerberg and, and the Facebook Corporation, and so both of those platforms, if millennials or say 35 zennials like myself are becoming your buyer, then that's a great platform for you and they work very well together, they're sister and brother. So if you know how to do Facebook ads, you know how to do Instagram ads. If you know how to go live on Instagram, you know how to go live on Facebook. If you know how to do stories on Instagram, you know how to do stories on Facebook, okay? So they work really well together. So those are the two social platforms that I highly recommend for you. Google My Business. If I'm in the market for a spa, hot tub, I'm Googling you guys. And I'm making some buying decisions based upon what I see. And so this is a primary platform for you guys. And we need to make sure that we're, we're giving off the right impression there. Your website. Of all the pieces that we're going to talk about today, this is the only owned land. The rest of it is rented, meaning that Facebook, your Facebook business page is, is land that you rent from Facebook. Same with Google. But website, you own it. So we got to make sure that that's an asset that we protect and that we uh, continue to update and put our best foot forward there. And then YouTube. YouTube is owned by Google and still a behemoth in the space on video and as a search engine. So because it's owned by Google, when I search for things like how do I you know, fix or how do I buy or what are the best products and video is going to be shown on Google, don't think for a second that they're not putting their own stuff first. And their own stuff is called YouTube. And that's why it's still such a primary platform. So these are the places that I think you should focus on first. Okay. Are there any different ones that you would add to the list? I would love to hear them if there are. And don't, I won't argue with you. I'm just curious. I remember hearing one was House maybe as a platform for some of you. Pinterest, I remember hearing as a possibility. And I, I don't disagree with those. I think there's probably some huge opportunity there. It's when you have your feet solidly on the ground with these platforms that I would start to maybe look at some of those other platforms as opportunities too. But make sure you get your fundamentals done first before you start branching out to some of the other ones. Or we won't do these as well as we would like. Cool? Any questions or thoughts? Yes, sir. Are you paying to boost your ads on Facebook? Great question. Are you paying to boost your ads on Facebook? I'm coming to that. I promise you I won't, I won't forget that. It's a very, very important question. Short answer is yes, just in case I fall off the stage. Okay. Hey, here it is. Is our ad money better spent on search or social? And the answer is yes and yes. There is no doubt that, in, and I don't say this to every industry that I speak in, but I want to be very clear with you all that if you're using the internet as a part of your business generation process, then you need to have a budget. And you need to spend some budget on Google Ads. And the question, of course, of where you should spend that money is, I always say if there are phrases that are being used on Google and you are not showing up for them, that is a great place to start for spending ad budget on Google. If you need a shortcut to get on the top of Google and you're not getting there organically, that's where you may, your dollars will be best spent. So that's Google. On social, if you're a business and you're marketing on Facebook and Instagram, you're not going to get to your audience without spending money anymore. Facebook is a publicly traded company. Gone are the days where they were, they were happy with just a large user base. Now they have, to, they have shareholders to report to. And so five years ago, if we all had a Facebook page and we posted a post on Facebook, about 60, 70% of those people would see that post. Today, only like 4 to 6% without sprinkling the magic pixie dust, which is dollars. Okay, so yes, the answer to your question is yes. And I'll dive a little bit deeper in as we go along. 
So in terms of prioritizing your profiles um, and building trust and credibility, your website, your directories, and your social media profiles are the ones that we're going to look at. Those are the ones that I'm kicking your tires on, prospects are kicking your tires on, and we're determining whether to do business with you or not. And there are some holes in your game, and we're going to explore those right now so that you can fix them, and that people, because you're generally not going to win the business because of a website or a social media profile, but you could lose it. You could absolutely lose it, and so let's make sure that doesn't happen. So, my big question for you all is, should your website be nominated on websites that suck.com? So I didn't tell Sarah or the Marquee Spas team that I was gonna do this, but they did give me access to all of your websites. And so I know there are some awards later on tonight, and I wanna give out the first award today. I'm going to give out the award for the website that I believe should be on websitesthatsuck.com in this room. Ladies and gentlemen, the website, I'm just kidding, I wouldn't do that to you guys. <laughs> ah, man, you, I mean, you should see some of your faces, that was awesome. <laughs> that is like my favorite part of the presentation, right? Because everybody's like, no, not me. Look, we all got work to do on our website, so do I. It's an ongoing process, okay? We all have fixes to make. I looked at uh, friends of mine that were, were traveling in on the same van, they had a beautiful website. But they're making changes, right? You guys are making changes. But I looked at it, it's very, very nice. So there's, but there's some constant changes that need to be made you know, year in and year out. But there are some major mistakes that I did see out there. So I am going to share those with you. But I'm not going to uh, harm anyone in the room as I show these examples. Now, if you do see your website here in a minute, it's because I'm complimenting you on something. Okay, so just be aware of that as we move forward. So again, asked, answered, what does your website need? Here are the critical things that need to be on your websites that are often missing on yours that I checked out. One is critical information. So my question back to you all is, what are the two or three things that most visitors who come to your website are looking for when they visit your website? Phone number. What else? Address, physical address. What else? Time the store's open. What was that? Those are, pretty, those are pretty critical. Those three things. Yes. Call to action. What you, do you want them to do? Do we want them to fill out a form? Do we want them to schedule an appointment? Great. That big red button to tell me what to do. Those are the four things. How easy or difficult is it for me to find it on your website? Whether I'm on my desktop laptop or I'm on my cell phone. We're going to look in just a second. I'm going to give you a chance to do that. Okay? But don't make me hunt for the most important information. And some of you don't even have the phone number up at the top. Did you know that 61.4% of people don't scroll on websites? And 38.3% of statistics are made up on the spot. Thank you for getting that. I appreciate that. I have no idea what the percentage is of people who don't scroll. But I will tell you that some people don't. So don't make them. Put it up so high that no matter what, everybody can see it. Everybody good on that? Don't put it at the very bottom. Why would we do that? Don't make them hunt. Fully mobile responsive. Now, two years ago, I would have given you mobile responsive. Now it's got to be fully, meaning that it's not just the home page. It's got to be every page. And the way I want you to do that at your, at your seats in just a minute is I want you to do the thumb test. The thumb test is quite simple. You will just navigate every page on your site, or the most important pages, and not move your four fingers, just your thumb. That's mobile responsive, right? That makes it easy for people to navigate on their phone. And if it's not easy to navigate, then maybe they'll go somewhere else. Over 50% of people are visiting your website using their mobile phone today. So let's make it an easy, friendly experience for them. Uh, social proof. SEO friendly and conversion focused. I'm going to show you these instead of talking about them here. So first of all, uh, this is one of your websites here, and I show this simply uh, for the fact that uh, critical information above the fold, just like I talked about. And the call to action, by the way, uh, which is right here. Very easy to see. Good, nice phone number right here, and physical address. Okay? So when I talk about um, 
Content above the fold, critical information, that's what I'm talking about. This is not one of your websites, because I have a, a little bit of an issue with it, but a couple things about this website. One is um, this text right here is very important text. It tells me what you do and if you're right for me. And I'm not going to explore the rest of your site unless those words tell me that I'm at the right place. When you go visit your site and you look at the first headline of your site, does it tell me that? Or does it say something like, we put luxury in luxurious? What does that mean? You know what I mean? Don't be too creative. Don't be too cute. Hot tubs and spas, you know, whatever the case may be, whatever the words that people are typing into Google to find you should be the words that you're using on your website. Because it's good for me as the visitor and it's good for the search engines as well. Because if you use the words on your website that I'm using on Google, you have a way better chance of ranking than if you're not. So that's the SEO part I was talking about. The social proof I was talking about is who says that you're better than the rest besides yourself? What tells me that I should trust you besides you telling me I should? That's what I call social proof. Those are awards that you've won. Those are um, years in the business. Those are um, real authentic testimonials. Maybe they're video testimonials. Things that I can see that says to me, wow, I'm at the right place. That's social proof. Okay, here's a big mistake I saw on a lot of your sites. These social media icons up here. I'm totally fine with, obviously, I'm the social media guy. I'm not going to tell you not to have social media on your website. However, you don't want to have the default icons because look what happened here. If you click on the G Plus here, which is Google Plus, this is where you go to off of this website. Google Plus is no longer available and brand. Let's just have a moment of silence for Google Plus. Thank you. They no longer exist as a social network. So why would you ever take somebody away from your website onto a social site that no longer exists? So when you guys go check out your websites, make sure that you only have social media icons that you're actively managing. Cool, everybody? Makes sense? These are just easy things to fix. And then your call to action, as he mentioned before. So here's the challenge with these. Uh, interrupting pop-up boxes. When you see these pop-up boxes come up on your, on your computer screen, what does it do to you as a consumer? It pisses you off. Very fair statement. It's annoying. The problem is it's also highly effective. So there's a challenge as businesses that we don't want to annoy our customers, but we also really want to capture their information before they leave because if we don't capture their information, we can't stay in touch with them. So I've got an alternative for you that you may want to consider. It's called an exit pop-up. This, the reason I think pop-ups are so annoying is because they interrupt us at the wrong time. So instead of interrupting us at the beginning or in the middle of our experience, exit pop-ups go right when they hover over the X bar and they're about to leave. It pops up and says, wait, 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 wait. Before you go, can I offer you 10% off if you decide to work with us? Or can I offer you the 10, the 10 things you need to know before buying a spa? no matter if you buy from us or somebody else. Something of value in exchange for my contact information and I was leaving anyway. So that's just a thought for you if you want to try to increase your opt-ins for your website. Okay, those are your websites. Next, and probably maybe the most important thing we're going to talk about today is Google My Business and your local directories. And that's just simply because until the whole new crop of buyers becomes the main buyer for you, us 30 to 60 year olds, 70 year olds who buy spas and buy higher end products like this are still going to Google and we're still using that search as a primary way of finding your business. And so you've got to pay clear attention to this real estate. It's Times Square real estate. It's really important real estate. So what I want you all to do, again at the break, is I want you to um, check out your directories. These are the places that list your business as well as competitors before they go to your website. And the reason these are so important is they live on Google. I don't have to go to your website. I can do all my research right here. So Google My Business, which is the directory that's owned by Google, 
And then there's that one, it starts with a, a Y. Oh yeah, Yelp. Yeah, Yelp, uh, that's one, the, the mafia, the internet. Can you cut that out of the video, please? I'd appreciate that. Uh, Yelp, everybody knows that, uh, that they can be kind of frustrating, right? Am I wrong here? Do you guys, yes, amen? Okay, we'll talk about them in just a second. Um, and then other, what are other directories? Any other directories that, that you guys have to pay attention to? What I want you to do is um, when you Google, say, uh, spas or hot tubs or whatever the term that somebody might Google along with their city and state, if there's another directory that lives on the first page, it's probably something we should pay attention to. If it doesn't, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it because consumers aren't getting to the second page. Home advisor. Home advisor. Another one, what was it? Angie's List. Angie's List, yeah, there you go. So those are two other ones that you might pay attention to if they're commonly showing up. Okay, so the first one is figuring out where we need to pay attention to. The second one is to claim the listing. So you can't own it and manage it if you don't claim it. We have businesses, as I mentioned, that we work with in our agency, and every month we get a very nice report from Google that tells us how many people used Google My Business, how, what words they used, what did they look at, where did they go afterwards? This all comes to us because we've claimed the page on Google. And we can update the page, and no one else can. And then I want you to update it. Are the phone numbers correct? Are the hours of operation correct? Are the, uh, the categories correct? And make sure that it's accurate information, because this is such precious real estate. Now, everything I've said up to this point, I know you've kind of been like, yeah, I get that. Let's get to the real nitty gritty of the whole thing and its reviews, right? Because that, at the end of the day, is what's really determining um, what people are seeing and, and whether they're making decisions. And I know this is a very emotional part of your world, as it is mine too, by the way. Nobody likes to get bad reviews. And unfortunately, in the world of the internet, it's like people have uh, drank a lot of alcohol and all of a sudden they're just courageous as heck on the keyboard, right? So they'll say the nastiest things on the web and then you meet them in person and they're saints, right? So reviews are a really tough part of the internet. So let's talk about those. I want you to be proactive in protecting your castle. So I want you to think about your business as a castle and reviews are like, positive reviews are like the moat around your castle. And these negative Norms and Nancy are trying to attack your castle. Stay with me here, folks. And every good review you have is just increasing that moat so that they can't get past it, right? That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to protect our castle. And it's not just on, sorry, no, I'm going back and forth. It's not just on Google and Yelp. It can also be on Facebook. You can do reviews on Facebook. It can also be on things like Glassdoor or Angie's List or other places that I'm not talking about. So just know the concept and don't worry so much about the directory that I'm referring to. And we don't need to motivate people to write negative reviews. They are already motivated. They're fired up. If you want to have some fun, just go check out some of the crazy things people put on the internet when it comes to reviews. They're super creative. This is Ford's Theater, and this was done by a person named Abe L. We'll call him Abe L. He gave it two stars. Was murdered here. Would not recommend. Very creative, right? I mean, people, Yelpers are very creative. Um, you can't satisfy everyone no matter what. This person says, beach is too sandy, but the water is clear. The beach was too sandy. <laughs> and don't get me started on Amazon reviews. As a book writer myself, this one, where is baby's belly button? Do not buy this book. You can see the ending right on the cover. <laughs> what is wrong with people, right? <laughs> but you can turn a critic into a champion. And this is what I, I do love when I see sometimes, and you all know this, is if somebody starts out as uh, frustrated and they write a negative review, oftentimes we can try to fix the problem and oftentimes they're trying to be heard. And I saw a real example when I was trying to buy a tchotchke toy for one of my children. 
Um, I noticed it here, and it started out as a very negative review, and it went up to four stars. And if you read the review, which I did, deciding whether or not I was going to buy this as a Christmas present or not, they were very honest. And at the very end, it says, I have to update my review, leaving four stars due to initial trouble. So the seller got back to me right after I posted, and on and on and on he goes about how they fixed the problem. And that actually, as a consumer, made me feel even better about the business if I didn't even see this review at all. So just be reminded that it is okay to try to help and do the best you can to fix, because oftentimes we can turn a critic into a champion. But I also recognize that sometimes you can't. So let me give you a couple things about negative reviews before I go to positive. One is, the question I always get about reviews is, should I respond? And the answer is yes. You should definitely respond, but you should be as diplomatic and tell your team to be as diplomatic as possible. There's no reason to try to start a fight with somebody who's looking for a fight, okay? Because it's not going to make you look good as the business owner. And I know most of you know this, but it's important to get affirmation or validation for what you already know. Definitely review, but be as diplomatic as possible. I'm sorry, definitely respond. Be as diplomatic as possible. Uh, so sleep on it. Take the emotion out of it. Try to fix the problem. A question I get all the time is, Corey, what if it wasn't us? What if they were just, what if it's a competitor? What if they were just wrong? Still respond. Try to get it removed from Yelp and Google, but I know that's a pain in the butt. So at least respond and be diplomatic in your response. Hey, I'm so sorry that happened to you. I know how it feels when a product comes to your house and it's not right. Unfortunately, we looked at our system and, and this isn't our business. This isn't, this isn't something that we did. I'm, again, terribly sorry it happened to you. I hope you find the right business, again, sorry, something to that effect, you'll do it better than me, and end it like that, okay? But at least, you know, you get to show your stuff, but also not look like you're, you're being super defensive. So always respond and try to help. If they come back and they want to fight you some more, try to take it offline. Hey, you know, I noticed that we're, we're just not able to, to fix your issue here, and I'm really sorry about that. Uh, if you'd leave your phone number, uh, or I'm going to give you mine, we'd be happy to discuss further over the phone, and then take it offline. Okay, so that's my recommendations when you do, if you do get negative reviews. But more importantly than that, what I prefer you do is to not spend so much energy worrying about the negativity and spend more energy worrying about the positivity. Being more proactive in getting positive reviews. So let's talk about that. What is your process for getting positive reviews on these sites that we've talked about? Do you have a process? If not, you should. Timing is everything. The best way I can illustrate that is my first ride. Now, do I have any Harley riders in the room here? A couple of Harley riders. So you guys will understand. We're kind of one and the same. We're family here. Um, the only difference is, little, little, little tiny difference here, but um, I drive a scooter. But other than that, me and Harley, we're pretty much the same, right? You guys know what I mean. So once I got this bad boy, cherry red, you know what I'm saying, I was going like, the first ride was amazing. I mean, 25, 30 miles per hour, um, downhill, you know, as I'm sort of trying to get going. Uh, the uh, most awkward thing is, first of all, I bought the real helmet, you know, like I'm even going fast enough to hurt myself, but that's fine. But the, the, the hard part for me was when I would pass by Harley riders on the, on the side streets that I drive on because I can't go on regular roads, but you guys get what I mean. Um, is some of them would wave to me, and I don't know if I'm supposed to wave back or not because I got a scooter, you know, so I'm like, should I, you know, I don't know if I'm part of the family or not. I know I'm probably not. But anyway, the point was, the first ride was awesome. That's when they should have sent me an email or got to me and said, hey, Corey, how was your first ride? It was amazing. It was awesome. I can't imagine, if I'm going 30 miles an hour and having the time of my life, I can't imagine a real Harley experience. Your first ride. What about their first dip? Do you guys have a process for the first time they go in? and experience their new tub, their new spa. So we're talking about that a little bit more, but I want you to be proactive in getting positive reviews. Are you asking them, though, on like Facebook, are you sharing that they have a hot tub, or are you just calling them because then nobody else is doing it? What are you doing? Good question. So the question is, is where am I getting those reviews from? So what I want to do is, I want, and I'm going to talk about this more in a, in a, in a bit when I, when I talk about getting referrals, but we want them to go to the channels that they want to go to. Okay, so if they're a Yelper, I want them to go to Yelp, because they're Yelpers. If they're a GMB or a Google My Business, then go to Google. If they love Facebook, go to Facebook. Give them some options. So this is what I want you to do. I'm going to answer your question for you. 
When a verbal testimonial or when you have a happy customer, I want you to have a process, whether it be the installer, whether it be the salesperson, whatever the case may be, to know the buying signals, know when they're ready, and to have a process to get that review. So if you have somebody who says, um, you know, I just want to let you guys know that was the best experience from, from sale to, to getting it in my home I've ever had. You guys rock. I would say, thank you, and the best way to thank us is to review us and maybe have a card, have something to be able to give them, an email to make it easy for them to review you. How many of you have a process like this? Raise your hand. About 20% of the room, okay? So let's make that 100% of the room. Let's have a process in place that when anyone within our company hears positivity verbally, that we turn that into a written review online. Write this down, folks, if you don't mind. Never let a verbal testimonial go unpublished. Never let a verbal testimonial go unpublished. That's tweetable, if you're tweeting along with me. All right? And then your social profiles, as we start to move more heavily into social here. Um, are they updated? Or are they, being, are they collecting dust? Are there profiles out there right now that you have out online that are not being updated. All it's doing is diminishing your credibility. At minimum, it's just doing nothing. But at the worst, it's actually maybe sprinkling in doubt to a potential buyer if they were to kick your tires on Instagram or Snapchat or another site and you're just not using it at all. Three followers, Do you, are you a real business? Um, are you out of business? You know, what's happening here? I'm getting a little concerned. So go look and make a determination whether or not you're going to actively manage it or delete it. Okay, how are your numbers there? Do you have a Facebook business page that you've had for three years and only have 21 fans? Then let's create a process to build the numbers because numbers matter. You don't have to, as a, as a spa business, you don't have to have thousands of followers, but you know what looks good and what doesn't look good. A couple hundred? Maybe a thousand, you know, have some sort of process of collecting fans if it's a place that you're spending time on. And then if you're getting messages there, what is your response time? If I go to a thing and I see, hey, um, we're having a little bit of an issue with our blah and I don't see your response as a potential customer, that could be a problem. All right, so those are the things we want to look at on our social profiles. All right, so we're going to take a digital audit little break here. Stay in your seats if you could. If you have to run out and use the restroom, I totally understand. This is, we're together for about 90 minutes, so uh, I'll give you 10 minutes, okay? So if you gotta go, go. But spend time at your tables, on your phones, checking out your websites, your local directories, and your social profiles, and look for holes. When I say holes, sorry guys, when I say holes, I mean do the thumb test with your website. Look for directories that have very little reviews. Because keep in mind, folks, if you have your Yelp business or your Google My Business and you only have three reviews and they're all positive, congratulations. But if one bad review comes to you, what's the percentage of bad reviews you have now? 25%. I mean, I went to FSU, so Florida State, so my math's a little, but you know what I mean. It's about 25%. But if you have 240 reviews and one review comes, no big deal, that person looks crazy. So look for the places where you have problems. And your social profiles, if it's not being updated, consider hitting the delete key, okay? So it is approximately uh, 1143, and so let's go to 1155, and I'll walk the room for a second, and let's do a digital audit of our profiles and make some uh, decisions on what we're gonna fix, okay? Everybody got the uh, activity? Begin. All right, everybody. I know you got another minute or two, feel free. I, I start, I, but um, is anybody coming up? As people are coming back, I won't start just yet, but any, um, any big ahas that we're seeing? Yeah? Heck yeah, I heard a heck yeah. Okay, that's good. Um, maybe some vulnerable spots. I noticed a couple of mobile versions of your site that aren't showing up as clearly as you might hope or wish. I noticed a couple ones where on the big site, they show up on the right or the left, but on the 
mobile site, they're all one line, so then all of a sudden it looks a little confusing. So you have to tell your programmer that you need different headers for your mobile site because there is no right or left. So it makes sense on the big one, doesn't make sense on the smaller one. So those are the kind of things, this is really important. I know it's like, well, you got a thousand different hats to wear, but spending a little bit of time on your baby, which is your website, to make sure that your consumers are having a good experience is really important. All right, so let's keep on moving. We're uh, more than halfway done. You guys are doing great. So, so far we've talked about uh, the process, we've talked about prioritizing your platforms, and we've talked about protecting your digital assets. Now we're going to talk about content, to me, which is the most challenging part of digital marketing, social media, is creating content that people actually want to read, watch, and engage with. So what I want you all to think about is, are you phoning it in? And I get why a lot of businesses do this. It seems like a necessary evil. It seems like something that we just have to do. And to be able to keep it up consistently is a lot of challenge. So instead of ignoring it, what we do is we just throw stuff up there and hope that it sticks. And you know, I get that. But what I'm hoping to help you with today is to create an efficient process to create content that people actually want to read and want to, want to look at in an efficient way. Um, a big thing that I want you all to keep in mind, so I'm going to try to give you some, some kind of big takeaways here that I want you to take back to your team. One is value over promotion. These are social media. By definition, the first word is social. So we have to remember that we as consumers are not there for business reasons. We're there to socialize with friends, to see what's happening, to see what people ate for dinner last night, I know, yada, 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 but they're typically there for non-business reasons and you're interrupting their day. So to sell me a spa or to sell me a product is probably not going to do the work. So what we have to try to figure out is how can we add value? How can we be a resource to people? How can we add value to their lives in one form or another, even though we're a business? That's what we're trying to accomplish. And it's the old 80-20 rule. 80% 80 value, 20% promotion. Yes, there are times where you're going to want to show a new Marquis Spa product line that just came out, absolutely. But that's because you've earned the right over the past couple of months of showing tons of value. And that's why people stay. So asked, answered, what type of content gets more engagement? I'll tell you what type of content gets more engagement. Ones that is authentic and transparent. One example that I've seen just recently is uh, UPS. How many of you have seen the UPS dogs? Raise your hand, a few people. So UPS is a very, in some ways, boring brand. They ship packages, right? You know, it's like it's UPS. And so they're not going to get a ton of engagement on Facebook and Instagram. Well, along comes their company-owned page or their employee-owned page, which is all about the dogs that they run into. So it's a whole page dedicated to the dogs that the UPS drivers run into and engage with and such. And it's blowing up. UPS is being talked about across news channels and everywhere more than they ever have before. Why? Because people love dogs. And that's what people care about. And so it's just, to me, was another example of finding an authentically social way to connect with their customers that has nothing to do with shipping packages, but still connects with their brand. So how do you be authentic and how do you be transparent? Video works better than written when it comes to engagement on social today. And so we're going to talk about video. Value, and then just like my friend down here asked before, making sure that if we're taking social media marketing seriously, that we have some sort of ad budget to boost these posts behind it. Even if it's a couple hundred dollars, if you have somebody managing your social media, give them an ad budget. Give them some sort of budget to be able to use towards some of these posts to get it to more fans and more followers. So how do we become authentically social? I love talking about this here because the first thing I ever experienced with Marquee was when they had considered me to be their speaker and I was shooting a video to send them to tell them a little bit about what I was going to speak about. So I went to their YouTube channel and the first video I saw 
was this one, the Make-A-Wish, Marquis celebrates the 100th wish with Louis. And I watched this and I was just so impressed and blown away by this video and our whole mission behind that. And it's a perfect example of being authentically social, meaning that we as people today, more than ever before, I think that the new generations, and I'm not a generational spe speaker, but millennials and zennials and, and, and these folks that are coming up uh, behind us, they, they want to know that they matter. They want to know that the world matters, and they want to know that the brands that they work with matter. And so keying into some of this stuff is very, very important and, and is going to work really well when it comes to your digital marketing strategy. But beyond just uh, what you're doing from a philanthropic perspective or giving back, what's your company culture like? What's your business culture like? Um, what's your community like? How can you be more transparent with us so that we know who you are, not just, not just the business, but the people behind the business? So as you guys leave for 2020 and 2021 and you get back with your teams and you talk about the world of content and social, I want you to say, how can we be more authentically social? How can we stop just posting articles about spas and you know, product lines and all that? And how can we dive a little bit deeper into our community, our culture, and who we are as, a, as, a, as an organization? Peek behind the curtain, if you will. How can you bring more of yourself to social? Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, video over written content. All right, so even Zuckerberg himself says, I see video as a mega trend, and over the next few years, it's going to dominate our platforms no matter what platforms they're talking about. So it could be WhatsApp, it could be Instagram, it could be Facebook, it could be Messenger, doesn't matter. Video, video, video. And the way I look at it is if it's the social media platforms, if they're doubling down on it, we as businesses slash marketers need to double down on it too. So there's two features I'm going to talk about today on social. Video is one of them. So when I talk about your content, don't tell us, show us. And I noticed a lot of, you know, I went through a lot of your pages and such, and I love it. You can't tell me about these products. You've got to show me. So it works so well in your industry. But double down on video. You don't have to do it all the time, and I'll show you my little rhythm to video in just a second. But your takeaway from this is quality over quantity. Instead of doing 10 pieces of written content, do one really good video or two really good pieces of video. It's more authentic. And let me just be really clear for those of you, a lot of you shoot video, and so this is validation or reinforcement for you. And some of you are kind of new to the whole video world and social. So there's two different ways of doing video. There's pre-recorded and live. So with live video, the reason live video is so exciting to us as businesses is because of the initial engagement. Any of you that have been on Facebook or Instagram recently, you've been navigating Facebook and all of a sudden, Martha Smith shows up at the bottom of your phone and says, Martha Smith is live. And you're like, why in the world? I've never engaged with Martha, done any kind of content with her, and all of a sudden, boom, she popped up on my Facebook. Why is that? Well, I'll tell you why. Because Facebook is pushing live video big time. And so is Instagram, so is LinkedIn, but that's a different story. So that's why she showed up. So there's an initial engagement push. If you want to get more engagement to your video, try going live. Now, the downside to going live is it's live. <laughs> Let me just be really clear. It's live, okay? So what happens after every one of these presentations is I watch your videos, and halfway through, somebody's like, you know what? I'm not feeling it. Can you just, let's start it over. No, you can't start over. It's live. People are watching right now. Okay, so just remember, it's live. You can delete it, but people had the chance to see it during that, in, that, that interaction. And that's also really exciting because as you're you know, touring a new product or you know, showing people behind the scenes or doing something that might lend itself to live, people can interact with you. And that's really neat. In the beginning, you'll be clumsy and you won't understand it. And it'll be like, is somebody commenting? I don't know if they're commenting. But after you do a few of them, you'll be like, oh, Stephanie, yes, absolutely. Hey, Stephanie, yes. Yes, we actually do have multi-jets here. Or yes, it does play music. Like, here, I'll play it, watch. And you can interact with them, which is so cool. So that's live. Pre-recorded has the opportunity to edit and make it look really good. So that lends itself to, you know, maybe it's a, a product um, tour that you want to do and you just want to make sure it's tight. 
So that's pre-recorded. It's going to live on your website. It's going to look on your live on your YouTube channel. You're going to use it over and over and over again. That's pre-recorded. You could put subtitles to it, that type of thing. Okay. So there's pluses and minuses. And my goal for you or commitment that I'd love for you to, to work on is to do one piece of episodic video content per week or per month if that feels a little bit more doable to you. But what tends to happen is you get excited about video because I, I, I encourage you to do it, but then you do it once and you don't do it again and you, you, you wonder why it didn't work. It needs to be consistent. So some sort of video per week or per month that can build off of each other. Last week we showed you this. This week we're going to talk about this. And next week we're going to talk about this. And you get into a groove. And that's how people start to get connected with it and like it, especially if they're in the mode of buying a spa or a hot tub. OK? All right, so many people are watching these videos without the sound on. Even on Instagram, as they're flipping through Instagram, Videos are auto-playing without the sound. So if you want to get more engagement, we've got to get the words on the screen. And this is a great tool to do it. So if you're an iPhone user, uh, it's called Clips. So write down the word Clips. And this will automatically put words underneath your video as you say them, as I'm about to show you here. And if you're an uh, Android user, well, I don't have anything for you. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm just kidding. Subtitle is, is um, one that I've been told. I'm an iPhone user, so I haven't used it, but that's what was recommended to me, so I'll share that with you. But this is what it looks like. Hey, everyone. It's Corey Perlman with just a quick, cool tip for you for shooting uh, video. So I'm playing with a new tool for me called Clips. Uh, it's on your iPhone app, and it enables us to shoot video just like this. Uh, but also puts these transcriptions, uh, subtitles, whatever you want to call them, right in uh, automatically. This is actually happening. I'm actually reading what I'm saying to you as I say it. And it's pretty accurate, I must say. Okay, so that's clips and that's pretty neat. And now I will tell you that they, it will say words or, or write words that you didn't say. Like whenever I say LinkedIn, it thinks I said Lincoln. And so you can go into the, um, the script and you can edit the words before you, you post it. This is pre-recorded, not live, just so I'm very clear. But man, an easy, easy way to be able to get the words below your videos for those of you shooting or considering shooting video. Now, the next thing I'm going to show you is a, um, it's a soapbox that I stand on and that I know my AV crew guys over here are excited about this as well. But as you venture out and you decide that video is going to be a tool that you're going to use in the future, I hope you don't do it the wrong way, and I don't think you ever will after you watch this video. So here we go. Enjoy. Hey, everyone. It's Corey Perlman with just a quick, cool tip for you for shooting. Uh... That was a joke. Of course, I wouldn't show you the same video. No, I did. I showed you the same video. It's this one. Sorry. Me. <laughs> This video didn't have to look this way. It could have been prevented. Say no to vertical videos. Vertical videos happen when you hold your camera the wrong way. Your video will end up looking like crap. <laughs> there are more and more people addicted to making vertical videos every day. It's not crack or nothing, but it's still really bad. There are two different kinds of people who are afflicted with VVS. The first group treats the videos they shoot like pictures. They don't mean any harm. They just don't understand that while you can turn a picture, you can't really turn a video. <laughs> the other group is people who don't give a Vertical video syndrome is dangerous. Motion pictures have always been horizontal. Televisions are horizontal. Computer screens are horizontal. People's eyes are horizontal. We aren't built to watch vertical videos. I love vertical videos! Nobody cares about you! If this problem's left unchecked, YouTube will begin showing four videos at once, just to save bandwidth. Leatherboxed vertical videos would be the size of a postage stamp. 
and it will spread everywhere. Movie screens have always been horizontal. If vertical videos become accepted, movie theaters will have to be tall and skinny. And all the movie theaters would have to get torn down and rebuilt. And by the time they were rebuilt, Mina Kulitz would be old and ugly. And birds would crash into them and die. And we will all get stiff necks from looking up. And no one will sit in the front row ever again. And George Lucas will re-release Star Wars again. The skinny edition. I was never really able to tell the story that I wanted to tell. This was a great chance for me to experiment with a new technology. You're a jerk. Every time a mobile device is used to record video, the temptation is there. Just say no. Say no to George Lucas. Say no to old Mila Kunis. Say no to vertical videos. And if you see someone doing it, say, you're not shooting that right, dummy. All right, yes, yes, thank you very much. Um, couple caveats, couple uh, apologies. First of all, there's children in the room I heard. Sorry about that, there's a couple. Uh, I think they blurted it out, but that's as dirty as the program gets today, I promise. Um, and second of all, to my, uh, my, my friends from, from afar who uh, were translating here and may have not been able to translate that, the, the bottom line to that message is to shoot horizontal. And I want to be very clear on this because there are times that shooting vertically makes sense. Uh, if you're doing selfie videos, you know, if you are Snapchat or Instagram, there are definitely times where vertical makes sense. The part that I'm talking about mostly for us is when we're shooting outward to make sure that we encompass the whole screen when we're shooting video. And many of you have seen this when you're on different social platforms and such that there is so much opportunity to be able to see the beautiful products and things that you're showing if you just would have went horizontal instead of vertical. But that's the nature of the message. Okay, almost done. We're heading down the, 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 the downside here. Um, the other feature that I want you to at least pay attention to or walk away with the idea that it's important are stories. So I've talked about video, and now I'm talking about stories. And again, I only bring you things that I think are important enough for you as a business to understand. And the reason I think stories are so important is this. Watch this. Now, there's a whole crop of us in the social media world, ages 40 and above, who have spent our entire existence on social media navigating news feeds like this, right? This is what we do on social. We navigate just like this, and we probably always will. But there's a new crop of people, age 40 and below, that they navigate social in a different way. They navigate going like this, actually like uh, left, right to left, left to right. Almost like they're reading a book or clicking like this. So it's going this direction, not this direction. How, is there anybody in this room that basically only looks at stories and doesn't even look much at the newsfeed anymore on Instagram? Can you raise your hand? One, two, three, four, five, six. There's seven people in this room, just in this room, that you're missing if you're posting on your normal news feed on Facebook and Instagram. So stories are important, and we need to understand them as a part of our overall social media strategy. So let me be very clear what stories are. It's a series of posts that create an experience, almost like an experiential post instead of one single post. So instead of a spa, it might be a series of pictures and video potentially that create more of a story about the spa, okay? So it lends itself to different things. So I'm shooting a story as we speak for this event. It works really well when it comes to events. Before, during, after, a series of pictures. You'll see all kinds of marquee spas and all kinds of things, your pictures and all, book signings and all this stuff on my story. Okay, it just lends itself better than one single picture or maybe a montage of pictures that would be in a post. All right, stories live for 24 hours. And here's the, here's the kicker that you got to think about. You may say, well, that's Instagram, Corey. I want you all at the next break to go to Facebook and look at what's at the top of the screen. Do you know what the top is? Stories. Like 33% of the real estate that you have on your phone right now is filled up with stories, whether you're looking at them or not. 
So it's a big part of the real estate on the two social networks that we're paying attention to. So stories and videos, when you guys go back to your offices, have a meeting around those two things. Who can take on stories? Who can be in charge of maybe once a week or once a month doing a story on our social feed so that we can get into that practice and reach that audience as well, okay? I just said all that. And my Instagram handle is cperlman, if I haven't said that already. Here's Facebook, what I was talking about. These are the stories that you can click through. Both businesses and individuals can post stories. And here's the other thing. You want an efficiency tip? You can link Facebook and Instagram. So if you create a story on Instagram, you can make it so when you hit publish, it automatically goes to Facebook. Oh my goodness. That makes its life so easy. Instead of having to create a story on both platforms, you just create one on one. Okay, so another efficiency question for you. If we're a smaller operation, how do we get all this done, Corey? So I wanna give you my little secret sauce because I'm a small operation too. And even though I'm in the world of digital, I, I travel around the world and I'm busy and I don't have time to be posting to my Facebook and Instagram. So I just wanna give you a little bit of my secret sauce as to what we do inside our company that this might work for some of you as business owners of your company. I look at the one thing, like Curly said, in City Slickers, the one thing, my one responsibility as the resident expert of my business, and as some of you are the resident experts of your business, is to create one piece of meaty content a week. So that's all I have to do is create one video, one blog post, something of material for my team to be able to slice and dice and create social media content. So if, you, so if some of you in the room are the social media posters and are looking for content, you gotta go back to some of your team members. You can just say, once a week, or maybe once every other week, could you create one two to three minute video for me that would share some value from your brain to that screen? I'll take it and I'll run with it. So that's what I do. I just concentrate, what's one thing, one thing I can do that I can talk about online that would be of value to my audience, and then my team or your team or whomever's doing your social can take it and run with it. And this is what we do, oops. Sorry guys, can you put that back up? My bad, I hit the wrong button. First time doing this, we'll put that back up. But I take my one piece of content and I put it on my Facebook and my Twitter feed and my Instagram and my email marketing. So that video becomes our email marketing piece for the week or for the month. And then we, we put it in there or on our blog. So I mean, we use it everywhere because Samantha Smith may just read your emails and Mark Perlman, my dad, might just read your social media content. So they're getting the same content, but in different ways. Thank you, guys. OK, so that's what it looks like. And I'll send you, obviously, this information. Another best practice that I hope you take with you all is to have a content calendar for your business. How many of you, by raise of hand, know that you have a content calendar for your digital marketing content. I knew you would, yeah. So that works really well for you and your company, right? So you guys use this and, and it helps her. She handles all the social media to keep everybody in the loop. Just imagine for a second that if everybody knew that on Tuesdays was Testimonial Tuesday. So on Tuesdays, we always have a testimonial go out. The sales team knows it. The installers know it. The general manager knows it. And so if social media person's running out of testimonials, she can shoot, hey, it's Testimonial Tuesday. Or maybe um, you know, one of the installers says, hey, guess what, everybody? I got you a Testimonial Tuesday, and they send it over to you. Everybody's working on the same thing. Whenever I see that the business owners or executives are disconnected to what's being posted on social, bad things tend to happen. So I would highly suggest having a content calendar and having meetings around this. What's coming up in the next couple of months? What can we use for Photo Friday or Community Thursday or whatever your calendar has? But if you guys have a calendar, it keeps everybody on the same page and it will make the people who are doing your social media lives so much easier. Am I right on this? Having a content calendar, she's giving me a big thumbs up. So take action. In what ways can you incorporate more video? 
maybe a, one, a weekly or monthly segment. What could be your one thing? Is it a frequently asked question that you, get every, that, you sh that you answer every week or every other week? Is it a new product that you highlight? Is it a weekly testimonial from a client, I'm sorry, or from a customer? How can you be more authentically social and can you commit to a calendar? And I'll give all of these to you that hopefully you'll take them with you and use them as sort of your goals as you move forward. All right, your last two social selling principles and then we're done. Turn clients or customers into champions. Done right, social media has allowed us to put cold calling where it belongs in the past. And so this is going to be all about getting our customers to become our sales force. So how do you turn customers into champions? And so this is what I was talking about, about building that relationship after the sale has been made and making that connection with them and maybe creating a process for you to be able to share in the experience of their, their inaugural dip in the tub. So, I mean, and again, you may do this, and this may just be the most ludicrous idea, but I've been thinking about you all for the last couple of weeks, and this just popped into my head. But what if every time somebody got a pool or a spa or a tub or whatever the case, or a sports tub or whatever the case may be, you know, they got something along with that to enjoy the moment. Maybe it's um, a bottle of champagne and some glasses. Maybe it's some toys, you know, things of that nature. I don't know, something, some sort of package that was delivered with it that they could experience that first dip in a more fun and creative way. And inside that package had a, some instructions that say, if we would love to share in your experience. So when you first dip, would you mind taking one picture for us and posting that picture using the hashtag, which is your anchor hashtag, What's your anchor hashtag, some of you might ask? Your business name. So I may not be, let me just be very clear with everybody on this. Your anchor hashtag is very important. If I'm not, if I'm your customer and I share the most glorious testimonial of all time on my social and I use your hashtag, you have the chance of seeing it. If I don't, you may never see it. And that's the most sad thing I've ever said in my entire life. That would be terrible. So by getting your customers like on their written materials to use your hashtag, which is your business name, your anchor hashtag, that's a way to be able to anchor yourselves to that content and to, of course, tag your business and to tag your business. So at ABC Spas or ABC Hot Tubs or whatever and ask them to create a shareable moment for you. This is a way to get your customers to become your sales force. Share, have them share their first dip. And I want you all to write this down because it might be the last thing I leave you with them, maybe the most important thing. But the best way to thank us is to tag us. So when someone says thank you to your team, to you, to your sales team, to the installers, whatever the case may be, train them to say the best way to thank us is to tag us. Get into the rhythm that your customers are your best sales team. And the more they start tagging you, the more that word of mouth spreads online. We here in the States have Nextdoor as a powerful social uh, networking site for neighborhoods. If at minimum you got into the rhythm of getting happy customers, home customers to mention you on Nextdoor, everything else I said probably doesn't matter. Them referring you on the sites that they are intimately tied to is so unbelievably powerful. And just like I said with reviews, we are less motivated to do it than if something bad happens. So when we're happy, you got to motivate us. All right? So take action. Do you have an anchor hashtag? If not, just tell your team. We need to have a hashtag to categorize our content with our branded name, with our name that we always use and we get our customers to use and everybody to use. When, when is the best time and place for referrals? When are we happiest? When is it the first ride? Is it the first dip? Is it in that first week? What's your current process for, for requesting referrals? And is there a way to incentivize? I had heard back in the room a couple of different unique creative ways to incentivize. Maybe in that package there's a $25 um, you know, pool store card or something that says, 
You don't have to do it, but if you do post about us, this is just a thank you to say, we know it took time out of your day, and we just hope you had a great experience. And that might encourage people a little bit more to do it. So in summary, here's your social selling principles. Follow the process. Prioritize your platforms. Be proud of your profiles. Create compelling content. Turn customers into champions, and then turn those champions into your sales force. And I'm going to leave you with this, and then I'm going to answer a few questions. I just want to thank you all for what you do. I, sometimes we forget, you know, in all the business dealings and the new product lines and sales and numbers and all that, is that you create memories. You all create these fun, memorable experiences that we get to have with our families, our spouses, and our neighbors and our friends. And it was funny because I was thinking back. I was like, well, you know, I'll go find a photo on, on Google or whatever. And then I was like, I wonder if I have a photo. Because I had a hot tub when I was a kid. I lived in Sarasota, Florida. So I lived in Florida, Sarasota. Average temperature, 80 degrees. But for whatever reason, we had a hot tub. Probably the only ones in Florida. But if you don't believe me, there I am, age, I don't know, two or three on the corner of my hot tub. And that was my mom's hot tub. And we would spend weeks and, and months and all my different years and memories floating around in that hot tub. And when I had bad days at school or whatever the case may be, I'd dip in that tub. Or when I needed to you know, talk to her about something or whatever the case may be or, or make memories with my friends, that was my tub. And my mom, unfortunately, passed away when I was 24 years old. And so to this day, those memories for me are even more important than ever they could be because I don't have her anymore. But I have those memories, and those are what you guys provide people. So thank you for doing that. I really appreciate it. Thank you for all that you all do. All right, with that, I'm going to answer a few questions. Um, that's my email address, Corey at ImpactSocialMedia.com. You can slide, uh, text the word 668 slides to 66866. I do have books for sale, a little bit awkward. Uh, they were put on the tables prematurely, so some of you got some. That's fine. I'm not going to take them back from you guys, but they are for sale. They're 20 bucks. Take cash or credit, um, but I'll come sign the ones that you guys have if you want. And uh, don't worry about buying them if, you, uh, if uh, this, those kids won't get diapers or food for the next few weeks, but it's totally fine. Don't worry about it. But with all that said, um, we've, got, we've got four minutes. I'll answer a couple of questions that you may have in the audience. And then I'll be here the rest of the day. So uh, come see me at lunch or afterwards or whatever. I want to make sure you guys get to lunch on time. But I'll be here the rest of the day and into the evening if you have questions. So anybody have any burning questions right now? Yes. Yeah, so the question is uh, marketing budget, percentage of marketing budget towards online. It, you know, it really it, it would depend on your results, I would say. So I would start light, obviously, if you're doing traditional and, um, you know, offline marketing and things of that nature, I would start to move a little bit more into digital and then watch the results and be very careful that you're measuring the results. Results can be a little tricky with marketing, so uh, eyeballs to your website, um, referring sites from your website, but make sure you have some tracking measures in place and increase that percentage if it's starting to make traction for your business. Um, but I always tell small businesses, start with a couple hundred bucks. I'm not asking you to spend thousands on something that's unfamiliar to you, but start small and grow it as it starts to hopefully work for you. Yes, sir. How long should a video be? Ah, how long should a video be? We are in the ADD generation right now, right? So the, the, you know, be very careful about making it too long. Somewhere between 90 seconds and three minutes is probably a good um, you know, rule of thumb. If you're going to go live, you want to expand that a little bit just because it takes uh, Facebook a little bit of time to generate an audience for you. So you might be more at like 10 minutes for a live video. So be prepared to add a lot of value in there. Over the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about blah. And by the end of it, you're going to know the type of spa that you need for your home. And hopefully that'll keep them for that duration. Are you good? Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Thanks for my, your time. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> yeah, one more. Yeah, can you, you got me up. Uh, so LinkedIn, uh, yeah, I'm glad you asked that. Real quick, everybody, LinkedIn and Twitter. 
Let's use that too. The reason I didn't, I, LinkedIn's my, one of my favorite social media sites. It's because I don't believe that your customer acquisition is there. It's a B2B social networking site. Is there opportunity? Of course, there probably is. But in your case, not so much. That's why I think. And Twitter, same thing. I mean, there's, you know, follow your favorite celebrities, your news sites, your politicians. But in terms of moving the needle, Facebook, I'd probably prefer, and I think she would agree with me, who uses uh, Pinterest a lot. Pinterest is probably better for you guys than uh, LinkedIn and Twitter, okay? All right, now I'm gone. Thanks.